Let's open with a word of prayer. Abba, we come before you right now on this your holy Shabbat, the seventh Sabbath of our countdown for Shavuot. We thank you for Shavuot tomorrow. We thank you for Shabbat today. Thank you for your Torah. Open the eyes of our understanding and lighten us to the hope of your calling as we study your Torah portion and I sow today. Teach us your ways and we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. B'Shem Yeshua, Mishiach In the name of Yeshua we pray. Amen and amen. All right, now so means make an accounting. And it comes from Benidbar or Numbers chapter 4, verse 21 through 789. And we'll start reading in verse 22 of Numbers 4. It says, take a census or take an accounting of the Gershonites by families and clans too. All the men between 30 and 50 years of age eligible for military service who will have their duties in the tent of meeting. These are the duties of the Gershonite clans, their functions and their loads. They will carry the curtain, uh, the curtain of the dwelling, the tent of meeting and its coverings and its covering of fine leather that goes over it, the screen of the entrance to the tent of meeting, the curtaining of the court, the screen for the entrance to the court surrounding the dwelling and the altar, the cords, all the accessories for worship and all the necessary equipment. They will be responsible for these things. So this would have been the duty of the priests of the firstborn to start with, but because of the sin of the golden calf, it passed on to the Levites. So these are the families of the Levites and their duties. They are basically the servants for the priests. All the duties of the Gershonites, their function and their loads, will be carried out under the direction of Aharon and his sons. You will see that they fully or fulfill their charge. Such are the duties of the Gershonite clans of the tent of meeting. Their work will be supervised by Itamar, son of Aharon the priest. You will take a sentence or a census of the Merarites by clans and families. You will take a census of all the men between 30 and 50 years of age, eligible for military service, who will have their duties in the tent of meeting. The load they will carry and the duties incumbent on them in the tent of meeting will be as follows. The framework of the dwelling, its crossbars, <coughs> poles and sockets, the poles round the court with their sockets, pegs, cords, and all their tackle. You will draw up a list of their names with the loads for which each is responsible. Such are the duties of the Merarite clans. All their duties in the tent of meeting will be supervised by Itamar, son of Aharon the priest. Moshe, Aharon, and the leaders of the community took a census of the Kohathites by clans and families. All of the men between 30 and 50 years of age eligible for military service for duties in the tent of meeting, the number of the men counted in their clan came to 2,750. Such was the total number of the men of the Kohathite clans who are eligible for duties in the tent of meeting and whom Moses and Aharon counted at Yahweh's bidding through Moshe. A census was taken of the Gershonites by clans and families. All the men between 30 and 50 years of age eligible for military service for duties in the tent of meeting. The number of men counted in their clans and families came to 2,630. Such was the total number of the men of the Gershonite clans who were eligible for duties in the tent of meeting, and whom Moshe and Aharon counted at Yahweh's bidding. A census was taken of the Merarite clan by clan and families, all the men between 30 and 50 years of age eligible for military service for duties of the, in the tent of meeting. The number of the men counted in their clan came to 3,200. Such was the total number of the men of the Merarite clan, whom Moshe and Aharon counted at Yahweh's bidding through Moshe. The total number of Levites whom Moshe, Aharon, and the leaders of Israel counted in their clans and families, the men between 30 and 50 years of age eligible for religious duties and for those of transporting the tent of meeting, came to 8,580. At Yahweh's bidding through Moshe, a census was taken of them, and each man was assigned his duty and load. So the census was conducted by Moshe as Yahweh had ordered him. That's the difference between the one that David did and the one that Moshe did. Yahweh told Moshe to do it. David brought a curse on the people because he did it just for military pride, basically. So the Kohanim, or the priests, and the Levites were set apart and belonged to Yahweh. They had no inheritance in the land of Israel at all. You had to be born into the tribe of Levi to be a Levite or a priest, and you could not convert to this tribe. We know in Ezekiel chapter 47, in the future, a stranger that has children among the tribes of Israel will actually get an inheritance in whatever tribe they dwell in. So they can be actually grafted into not just Judah, but into any tribe they want except for Levi, because Levi has no inheritance. So they can't be grafted into Levi. 
to be a priest, you had to also be able to prove your lineage. We can see this in Nehemiah 7.63. When they came back from Babylon, some of the priests couldn't prove their lineage, so they couldn't partake, partake of the tithe that they would normally have, which was the sacrifices and everything else. Verse 63 of Nehemiah 7 says, And of the priests, the son of Hobiah, or Hobiah, the sons of Hekaz, the sons of Barzilla, who took a wife of the daughters of Barzilla, the Gileadite, and was named after them. These searched among their ancestral registration, but it could not be located. Therefore, they were considered unclean and excluded from the priesthood. You can't prove your lineage. You can't actually claim to be a Levite or a priest to get the tithe, biblically. And the governor said to them that they should not eat from the most holy things until a priest arose with Urim and Tumim. That's the only way to prove it if you can't prove it by record is to have a priest that actually has the Urim and the Tumim and can get a direct word from Yahweh. So, in order to get the tithe, you got to be able to prove your lineage. So if you were not born a priest or a Levite, how could you become that consecrated to Yahweh? Because it's not fair that not everybody was born in that tribe. Not everybody could do that. So Yahweh made a way. And it's in our Torah portion in Numbers chapter 6, starting at verse 1. Yahweh spoke to Moshe and said, Speak to the Israelites and say, If a man or a woman... Now, women are always looked down on as, in a biblical sense, as not being able to do exactly what a man could do. But in this situation, Yahweh wanted to make sure that the women were included as well to be just as consecrated to Yahweh as they desired to be. So if a man or a woman wishes to make a vow, the Nazarite vow, to vow himself to Yahweh... So this is how you can belong to Yahweh too, just like a priest. He will abstain from wine and fermented liquor. He will not drink vinegar derived from one of the other. He will not drink grape juice or eat grapes, be they fresh or dried, so no raisins. For the duration of his vow, he will eat nothing that comes from the vine, not even juice of unripe grapes or skins of grapes. As long as he is bound by his vow, no razor will touch his head until the time for which he has vowed himself to Yahweh is completed. He remains consecrated and will let his hair grow freely. For the entire period of his vow to Yahweh, he will not go near a corpse. He will not make himself unclean for his father or his mother or his brother or his sister should they die since on his head he carries his vow to his God. This is just like the priests. When the anointing oil is on the priest, they can't make themselves unclean either. So this is basically how a common person can be as just as sanctified to Yahweh and belong to Yahweh like the priests do. If anyone suddenly dies near him, making his vowed hair unclean, he will shave his head on the day he is purified. He will shave his head on the seventh day. On the eighth day, he will bring two turtle doves and two young pigeons to the priest at the entrance of the tent of meeting. The priest will offer one as a sacrifice for sin and the other as a burnt offering and will then perform the person the right of expiation for the pollution which he had contracted from the corpse now why is it seven days why does it say the seventh day does anybody remember it goes back to the ashes of the red heifer you were to actually cleanse yourself on the third day and on the seventh day and then you were clean you were sprinkled with the water from the ashes of the red heifer so you've got to do this in order to be consecrated or clean he will consecrate his head that same day. Verse 12. He will vow himself to Yahweh for the period of his Nazarite and will bring a male yearling lamb as a sacrifice of reparation. The time already spent will not count since his hair had become unclean. This is the ritual for the Nazarite on the day when the period of his vow is completed. So we're going to look at Paul. He actually instituted the vow of the Nazarite in Acts chapter 18 verse 18 when he was in Sancria and he had a vow and he shaved his head why did he shave his head to start with he wasn't unclean for the dead well it's because all the hair even though it doesn't say it here in numbers the hair that you grow during the vow is all consecrated to Yahweh so if you start with hair already on your head that hair is not consecrated so it's defiled hair so you got to shave it off to start with and then you start your vow basically bald and everything you grow is burnt on the altar when your vow is done as we're gonna see so bringing his offering to Yahweh, verse 14, an unblemished male yearling lamb as a burnt offering, an unblemished yearling lamb, you lamb, as a sacrifice for sin, an unblemished ram as a peace offering, verse 15, and a basket of unleavened loaves made of fine flour mixed with oil, 
and of unleavened wafers spread with oil with the cereal offerings and libations appropriate to them. The priest, having brought all this before Yahweh, will offer the Nazarite sin sacrifice and burnt offering. So there's a sin sacrifice and a burnt offering involved here. The latter will then offer the ram as a communion sacrifice with the basket of unleavened bread. And the priest will offer the accompanying cereal offering and libation. So we've got three animal sacrifices, one for sin. We've got unleavened bread. We've got a cereal offering and a drink offering libation. So there's like six offerings involved in this particular thing. So as we're going to see, when Paul is proving that he keeps the Torah and he's going to pay for four other people's vows, we're talking with his included 15 animal sacrifices and then 15 of these other things as well. So it, it was not cheap. He went to great expense to prove he kept the Torah. Verse 18, the Nazarite will then shave off his vowed hair at the entrance of the tent of meeting and taking the locks of his vowed head, he will put them in the fire of the communion sacrifice. The priest will take the shoulder of the ram as soon as it is cooked with an unleavened cake from the basket and an unleavened wafer and put them in the hands of the Nazarite once he has shaved off his hair. Why is he doing this? Because normally the priest would offer it. Because the priest is usually the most sanctified and holy. But at this particular time, the Nazarite does it because he is that sanctified and holy. He's even above the priest at this point because he did it voluntarily. With these, he will make the gesture of an offering before Yahweh, a wave offering, as is the holy thing. It reverts to the priest in addition to the forequarter that has been presented and the thigh that he has been set aside. So it goes back to the priest when he offers it, but the Nazarite himself is the one that offers it to Yahweh in this particular instance. Only time a regular person can do that. It's during the vow of the Nazarite. After this, the Nazarite may drink wine. Such is the ritual for the Nazarite. If besides his hair, he has also vowed a personal offering to Yahweh, he will, apart from anything else that he his means allow, fulfill the vow that he has made in addition to what the ritual prescribes for his hair. So you could do additional vows as well. So anybody could consecrate themselves to Yahweh and be as set apart as a priest through the vow of the Nazarite and actually offer a wave offering to Yahweh, which would never happen at any other time because the priest is the one that does that. Now, Paul took this vow voluntarily, like, like I said. Let's look at Acts 18.18. 18. It says, So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair shorn at Sancria, for he had taken a vow. And the only vow in Scripture where you shave your head is the vow of the Nazarite. So Paul did this voluntarily in Sancria, which is nowhere near Jerusalem. Jerusalem's where you have to finish the vow. And we see this in Acts 21. And this is where a lot of people believe that James gave Paul bad advice because he told him, hey, these guys have this, this vow, shave your head and, and pay for their expenses, and then everybody will know that you keep the Torah. And so I've heard a lot of Christian pastors say that James gave him bad advice. But you know what? Paul had already taken the vow two chapters earlier in Acts 18 of his own free will. He wasn't influenced in any way. He was just going to finish his vow at Jerusalem and then pay for the expenses because he'd already taken the vow and his hair was already growing. And so James wasn't the one that actually initiated it for Paul. Paul was just going to Jerusalem to finish it, to complete it. So Paul began this Nazarite vow in Sancria, but like I said, it had to be finished at Jerusalem. So let's look at Acts 21, 18. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the Torah. This is, should be our testimony. Everybody, they understood the Torah. It was all about loving the Father. And these Jews, they believed in Yeshua, but they were still zealous for the Torah because they knew how to love the Father. Yeshua set the example. But they have been informed about you that you teach all Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. Now the customs I could see because they were added, but Paul never told anybody not to keep the Torah because it's the word of Yahweh. It's how you love the Father, by obeying his commandments. Verse 22, what then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them 
and pay their expenses. So that's what I'm talking about. He's going to pay for 15 animal sacrifices, five of them for sin. And then five different uh, cereal offerings, five different unleavened wafer offerings, and five different libation offerings. Talking big bucks here. Animals are not cheap. I mean, today, a, a sheep, they're going for about four bucks a pound on the hoof. So, I mean, you can imagine how much money that would have been back then. So Paul did this to prove once and for all that he kept the Torah. We've all been led to believe that the law of God was nailed to the cross and that we're no longer to keep it. That's from misunderstanding some of the things of Paul for looking at it in the English and not actually reading it in the Greek because it's completely different in the original language. It was the penalty for sin that was nailed to the cross, not the Torah itself. But when we violated it, there was a penalty to pay. Yeshua took that penalty upon himself. That's what was nailed to the cross was our penalty, not the Torah itself because the Torah is all about loving God. It's called chorographon in Greek. It was the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, the condemning sentence, not the law itself, because the law, Paul says in Romans 7, is ordained to life. We're going to look at it here in a minute. And you can see what he really taught about the Torah. So as we take a closer look at what Paul really taught, we'll see that just the opposite is true. Look at Philippians 3, verse 3. For it is we who are the circumcised, we who worship by the Spirit of God, and make our boast in the Messiah. Messiah Yeshua. We do not put confidence in human qualifications, even though I certainly have grounds for putting confidence in such things. If anyone else thinks he has grounds for putting confidence in human qualifications, I have better grounds. Brit Millar, circumcised on the eighth day, by birth belonging to the people of Israel, from the tribe of Benjamin, which was part of the southern kingdom. Benjamin and Judah was remaining in the southern kingdom with some of the Levites. A Hebrew speaker, which means he grew up speaking Hebrew as its native tongue with Hebrew-speaking parents. In regards to the Torah, a Pharisee, a Perush. In regard to zeal, a persecutor of the Messianic community. In regards to the righteousness demanded by legalism, blameless. Now, what is legalism here? It's keeping the Torah without the Spirit. Doing it in the, in the flesh, it becomes works of the flesh. Trying to earn your righteousness by just doing it in the flesh. That's, it was never designed to bring righteousness when you're just in the flesh. The Holy Spirit in you doing it will bring righteousness but it's only if you have the Holy Spirit you've got to be born again but the things that used to be advantages for me I have because of the Messiah come to consider a disadvantage his religious training he, he learned under the top guy Gamliel was was Shaul's instructor you can actually read Gamliel's teaching in the Mishnah he's recorded he was the chief rabbi of Israel in Paul's day there was a thousand students that would apply to be able to sit under Gamliel you know how many out of those thousand actually made it? One. And that was Shaul. That was Paul. That's how sharp he was. He was the one guy that got to make the cut. So he was. He didn't even mention that fact, but that's, that's what it is. I mean, the people, the native Israelis in, in Israel, I learned that from them. One for Israel. It's an awesome ministry. He goes on and says, but because of Messiah, I called, called all that a disadvantage. Not only that, but I consider everything a disadvantage in comparison with the supreme value of knowing the Messiah, Yeshua, as my Lord. It was because of Him that I gave up everything and regarded it as garbage. Actually, in the Greek, it says, crap, dung, in order to gain the Messiah and be found in union with Him, not having any righteousness of my own based on legalism, but having that righteousness which comes through the Messiah's faithfulness, the righteousness from God based on faith or trust. And that is also obedience, as we're going to see. Yes, I gave it all up in order to know Him. That is to know the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering as I am being conformed to His death, so that somehow I might arrive at being resurrected from the dead. It is not that I have already obtained it or already reached the goal. No! I keep pursuing it in the hope of taking hold of that for which Messiah Yeshua took hold of me. Brothers, I, for my part, do not think of myself as having yet gotten hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me and straining forward towards what lies ahead, I keep pursuing the goal in order to win the prize offered by God's upward calling in the Messiah Yeshua. Therefore, as many as of as of us as are mature, let us keep paying attention to this. And if you are differently minded about anything, God will also reveal this to you. Only let our conduct fit the level we've already reached. 
Brothers, join in imitating me and pay attention to those who live according to the pattern we have set for you. This should be our testimony, guys. We should be able to tell people, follow our example, because we're walking the way Yeshua did. Shaul was able to do it. We can too, if we die to the flesh. So was Paul telling us, telling us here that he no longer followed God's law, or that he no longer followed Pharisaic law that he might obtain Messiah? In Pharisaic Judaism, which we call rabbinic Judaism today, the rabbis are descended from the Pharisees. The Sadducees were the priests that were in charge of the temple, and when the temple went away, they kind of lost their job. So in Pharisaic Judaism, as well as in modern rabbinic Judaism, there are two different sets of writings that are called the law. The first is the teaching and instruction given to us by God, which is called the Torah. Now this law is specific, it's specifically the first five books of our Bible, and it's called the Torah, or the Pentateuch in Greek. Penta being 50. Pentecost means 50 days, which will be tomorrow. So the meaning was eventually expanded to include all of the writings that we call the Tanakh. And that's an acronym for the Torah, the Nevi'im, or the prophets, and the Kituvim, or the writings. Been mislabeled the Old Testament, because it is not the Old Testament. It is the living Word of God that is forever settled in the heaven. That's Psalms 119, verse 89. And it won't return to him void. Satan was defeated by three quotes from Deuteronomy when Yeshua was tested in the wilderness. He could have quoted anything. He's the Word of God made flesh. He knew exactly what he was going to teach Paul, what he taught Peter, what he taught James, what he told Moses. And you know what he chose? He's facing the biggest guy from the kingdom of darkness. And so he pulls out the biggest gun to kick his hiney, and he quotes three quotes from Deuteronomy. Because that's how powerful the Torah really is. And that's why Satan fights it so hard. He does not want us to understand the power that is in it. He told Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you will meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then you'll make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. The Torah will make you prosperous and give you success, just like Yeshua, who is the Torah made flesh. So the meaning, like I said, was eventually expanded to include all the writings of the Tanakh. Yeshua referred to this fact in John 10, 34, where he included the Psalms. He says, have you not read in your law that you are gods? And that was from the Psalms. So the second set of writings that's called the oral law, or in rabbinic Judaism, they still consider it oral Torah. It's in modern rabbinic Judaism. The largest part of this oral Torah is the Talmud, which is like an encyclopedia if you've ever seen one. It's like probably probably 15 to 20 volumes that are the size of encyclopedias. And the way that the Talmud is laid out is you've got the Mishnah in the middle, which is the original oral law. It's where Gamaliel and Hillel and Shammai and all the ancient rabbis actually wrote, or, or it was compiled and written down in what's called the Mishnah. And then the, the actual other parts of it is the Gamara that kind of surrounds the Talmud. And, um, and it's the more modern rabbi's commentary. And then you've got Rashi. He's got his own section all by himself. This is in the Babylonian Talmud, which is in the actual... There's two different kinds. There's the Jerusalem Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. But most of the scholars were taken to exile in Babylon, so Judaism today considers that the, the, their primary oral Torah. And uh, as we study, we're going to see that Paul was rejecting Pharisaic law and not the Torah of God because it was... That's what Yeshua taught about. I mean, he says, you've heard it said that uh, actually he t he's talking about honoring your father and your mother. But there was a teaching in Pharisaic Judaism that if you had money and you wanted to dedicate it to the Lord, it was called Korban, and then it was off limits, and you couldn't even help your parents with it. That's not what Torah says. Torah says you are to help your parents. And rabbinic Judaism says no. They, they made fences, the washing of the hands. They were commanded to do it like it was Yahweh. Yeshua went out of the way to not do that because Torah doesn't say we have to. It's nothing wrong with washing your hands, but it's not a salvation issue like they were trying to make it. These were the additions that they made. I mean, there's seven biblical commands about what to do on the Sabbath or what not to do. Rabbinic Judaism has made 1,050, if you want to read in the Talmud. I mean, that is what he's talking about. It's all these added things that do nothing to please Yahweh. They did it so that people wouldn't even get close to trying to break it. It's called fences around the Torah. And so it's worthless. That's basically what was nailed to the cross. Not, not just that, but that's, that was the, the thing that was causing the separation in Ephesians 2. It was the oral law. It was not the, the Torah itself, because the Torah talks about how we're supposed to love the stranger in our midst, because we were strangers in Egypt. 
But Pharisaic Judaism says you're not even supposed to go into the house of a Gentile. That's why when Peter went to Cornelius, he says that you've heard it, you know how it's unlawful for one who is a Jew to go into one who is a Gentile. Unlawful by whose law? It's not the Torah. It's the rabbinic additions. That's what Paul's coming against. That's what Peter was trying to point out. That's what Yeshua was pointing out. So the Torah is good. It is, it's Torah in Hebrew literally means instruction or teaching. It's the instructions of our father to his children. I mean, we all, when we have our own kids, we're going to give them rules to follow. And we want them to follow because we're not trying to just take their fun away. We're keeping them safe. We're going to do, let them know what's, what's best for them so that they can grow and be strong and be protected and, and grow to be the men of God that they're supposed to be. That's what the father did with the Torah. It's his instructions to his kids. Now, the Talmud, on the other hand, is the religious instructions of the Pharisees. And that's what Paul is coming against when he's coming against the law in that aspect or trying to keep God's law for salvation, which it was never designed to do either. So as we study, we will see that Paul was rejecting Pharisaic law and not the Torah, which was given to us through Moses at Mount Sinai. Paul tells us to follow his example and others that walk as he walked by the same pattern. Now let's take a look at Paul's lifestyle after his conversion. This is after he gets born again. Yeshua knocks him off of his horse on the road to Damascus. And let's see if we can determine what this same pattern might be. In Acts 18, 19, this is right after he takes the vow of the Nazarite because he's in San Korea and he shaves his head because he's got a vow. The next verse says, And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay longer, a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. Why would he care about that? Because it's all about loving the Father. The feast days, or what we would call the ceremonial parts of the law, that's all about loving the Father. In Hebrews 8, God raised a tabernacle that was raised by God and not man. He could have had anything he wanted, and he chose to have a tabernacle with a high priest and all the things that Moses copied and set up here on the earth. That's what God wanted, and he could have had anything, and that's what he chose to have. So it's not old covenant worship. It is like cutting-edge worship that pleases the Father. So he's going to go back to keep this feast in Jerusalem. But I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. So even though Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, was ministering in Ephesus, he still felt it necessary to hurry back to Jerusalem to be obedient to God's instructions in his Torah. And that comes from Exodus 23, 17 and Deuteronomy 16, 16. So Paul understood the importance of following our Father's teachings and instructions contained in his Torah. It's all about loving the Father. Acts 20, verse 16, says, For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost, Shavuot, because that was the, one of the commanded pilgrimage feasts. That's what we have tomorrow. Now, we don't have a temple in Jerusalem, so we're not going back there today. There's no priesthood. can't do everything that was prescribed. But when that is reestablished, if we can, we're going to be going back to Jerusalem for Passover, or unleavened bread, Pentecost is the second one, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. The rest of them you can do wherever you're at, but those three, all the men from Israel were supposed to go to Jerusalem to appear before Yahweh at his temple. So again, Paul is hurrying back to Jerusalem to keep the feast as commanded in Torah, which is another thing when Pentecost fully came. Remember in Acts chapter 2, there were men from all over, from all the different countries, and they all heard them speaking in tongues in their own language because they were from all the different nations and they were coming there because of what the Torah said. You got to make the pilgrimage feast. So that's why there was these men from everywhere in Jerusalem and spoke all different languages. They were being obedient. So we all know that our Messiah Yeshua kept the law perfectly by the Spirit. Now we can see from this next passage that we are told to do the same. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. Now, in chapter 3 of this first, the same book, we're going to look at it here shortly, but chapter 3, 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is defined as violating the Torah. So John is saying right here, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not, or in other words, that you not violate God's Torah, because that's his definition of sin. And if any man sins, if any man does violate the Torah, we have an advocate with the Father, Yeshua Messiah, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 
and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. You can know for sure that you know Yeshua because you keep his commandments. He that says, I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoso keeps his word in context, whoso keeps his commandments, and which commandments? We're going to see the next last verse. It's the ones that Yeshua kept for our example to follow. Whoso keeps his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Why is that? Because the Torah is all about love. It all hangs on the two greatest commandments about loving God with all your heart, soul, and strength and loving your neighbors yourself. The rest of it's the details, God's definition of how to do that. Because you can do whatever you want, but if it's not God's definition, it's not really love. Hereby we know that we are in him. We can know that we're in Yeshua because we keep his commandments. Verse 6, he that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Now in context of this passage, it's talking about keeping the same commandments, not just loving his brothers. I mean, that's part of it. He healed the sick, he raised the dead, he cast out devils. We're supposed to do that too. But in context, we're supposed to keep the same commandments because it's all about loving the Father, the way that Yeshua showed us and demonstrated for us. We're instructed to walk even as Yeshua walked. So we're given these instructions that we sin not and that the love of God be perfected in us. In order to sin not, like I said, we have to first know the biblical definition of sin. Now, it's not just John that tells us, it's Paul too. Look at Romans 3.20. It says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law, or by the Torah, is the knowledge of sin. Keeping the law won't get you justified in his sight. It shows you what is sin and what's not sin. Verse 7, or excuse me, Romans 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid! No, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law said, you shall not covet. And then going on in 1 John 3, 4 that I just quoted, it says, Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So knowing that, if you're eating a pork chop, what's that called? It's called sin, because the Torah says don't eat swine's flesh. Matter of fact, Isaiah 66 says when Yeshua returns, he's going to be in vengeance on those that are eating swine's flesh in the mouse and all the abominable things. He's going to not be happy. So from these scriptures we can see that sin is defined as transgressing the law. Now let's look again at John's instruction to walk as Yeshua walked, 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things write out unto you that you sin not. Don't violate the Torah. It's the same thing again. He that says, verse 6, that he abides in him ought himself to walk even as he walks. So in essence, John is telling us that he is writing these instructions to us that we not transgress the Torah. Now, with this, this definition of sin in mind, let's take another look at some of Paul's other teachings. Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin, or shall we continue to violate the law that grace may abound? God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If you're dead to your flesh, you shouldn't be sinning. You shouldn't be violating the Torah. Shall we continue to transgress the Torah that grace may abound? God forbid. Now let's look at what Paul taught about salvation. The Old English of the King James Version of the Bible makes it hard to clearly see what Paul is saying. So I'm going to use the New Jerusalem translation here. It's Romans 10.4. It says, But the law has found its fulfillment in Messiah, so that all who have faith will be justified. Moses writes of the saving justice that comes by the law. So there's saving justice that comes by the law and says that whoever complies with it will find life in it. There's actually life in the Torah. But the saving justice of faith says this, do not think in your heart who will go up to heaven. And then Paul adds that is to bring Christ down. Or who will go down into the depths? That is to bring Christ back from the dead. What does it say then? The word is very near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, the faith which we preach. So what's this word of faith he's talking about? We're going to look at it that if you declare with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. It's by believing with the heart that you're justified, and by making the declaration with your lips that you are saved. So it almost looks like Paul is teaching a new way of salvation here until we look at where Paul is getting his teaching from. Now we're going to go back to the King James. 
and we'll compare two verses at a time. To really understand what Paul is teaching, all of Romans should be read in context. Now, we don't have the space to deal with it here, but let's look at one previous verse. It's in Romans 6, 15. What then shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid! Don't you know that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey? His servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, and that means violating the Torah, which leads to death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Now, where does Paul get this teaching from? You guys have a Bible handy? If you can look at it with your phone, go to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and look at the last two verses. Deuteronomy chapter 6, the last two verses. Whoever gets it up, read it first. And actually, uh, the microphone is in front of Solomon, so we need to turn on channel 7. Okay. Uh, the last two verses. Last two verses of Deuteronomy 6. All right. And Yahweh commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear Yahweh our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is that day, or this day. Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before Yahweh our God as he commanded us. So that's where Paul got this teaching was right out of Deuteronomy. It's righteousness for us if we observe these commandments. That has to do with abiding in Yeshua. So here Paul informs us that even though we're not under the law, violating the law still leads to death, and obedience to God's law still plays a major role in our righteousness. So this understanding will help us understand what he is trying to teach us in chapter 10. So let's look at Romans 10:6. But the righteousness, which is of faith, speaks on this wise. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Messiah down from above. Where is Paul getting this from? Right out of Deuteronomy 30, verse 9. And the Lord, or Yahweh, your God, will make you plenteous in every work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, and in the fruit of the, your cattle, and in the fruit of your land for good. For Yahweh will again rejoice over you for good, as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you shall hearken unto the voice of Yahweh your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the Torah, and if you turn unto the Lord your God, Yahweh your God, with all your heart and with all your soul, for this commandment, now this is where Paul's quoting, for this commandment which I command you this day, it's not hidden from you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who shall go up for us to heaven to bring it down unto us that we may hear it and do it. Moses is talking about the Torah. Paul adds that is to bring Messiah down from above. He's saying Yeshua is the Torah. We know that from John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Yeshua is the Torah. So Moses is actually talking about the Messiah but in a veiled way. We call that in a sowed level understanding. It's a mystical thing like Paul when he's teaching about the rapture. It's not just laid out for everybody to clearly see. It's a mystical understanding that the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to. So Paul is showing us that Yeshua is the Torah. And Moses is teaching that you gotta have the Messiah in order to be saved. So Moses is clearly teaching obedience to God's Torah here. Paul is showing us that obedience to God's Torah, what it points to. And again, like I said, according to John 1, 1, 1, Yeshua is God's Word made flesh. So the law was made flesh to show us clearly the example of how God wants us to live. Now let's go on with the comparison. Look at Romans 10, 7. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Messiah from the dead. But what says it? The word is nigh you, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So what's the word of faith Paul's preaching? It's the Torah. Deuteronomy 30, 13. Neither is it beyond the sea, and that's what they called the deep, was the sea, that you should say, who shall go over the sea for us to bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very nigh unto you in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. And that's what Paul says, that is the word of faith that we preach. It's obedience to Torah through the Holy Spirit and the Messiah is what Paul's teaching. So he's not teaching against the Torah. He's quoting Moses in his teaching so that we'll know. He expects everybody to have a Bible, or at least go to the synagogue where you're going to hear it read. So he, he's referring back. This is called a teaching of a remez, where you refer back to something else. So he's teaching them in remez in Romans chapter 10, and he's referring back to Deuteronomy chapter 30. 
Because that's the Bible. So Moses spoke of doing God's law, and Paul's not teaching anything different. He's revealing that God's law is pointing us to Yeshua. And he goes on in Romans 10, 9, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Yeshua and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. But that's only part of it because you've got to go back to where he's teaching to know what the rest of it is. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So Deuteronomy 13, or 30, 15 says, See, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil, that, in, that I command you this day to love Yahweh your God, to walk in His ways, to keep His commandments and His statutes and His judgments, that you may live and multiply. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. He even gives us the right answer, that both you and your seed, your children, may live, that you may love Yahweh your God, because it's all about loving him and loving our neighbor, and that you may obey his voice, and that you may cleave unto him, for he is your life. Didn't he just say that about the Torah? Yeah, because he is the Torah. Yeshua is the Torah made flesh. He is our life. And his Torah shows us how that pathway works. And the length of your days. So Paul's explaining how we choose life. It's by embracing the Messiah and then walking in obedience to his commandments. He's affirming to us that obedience to God's law is a crucial part of choosing life. He's also letting us know that the next step in choosing life is embracing God's law made flesh, his Messiah. So you can't walk in Judaism and keep the law of Moses without the Messiah and be saved because they're one and the same. If you reject Yeshua, you're rejecting the Father. 1 John 2 tells us that. So he's also letting us know, he's explaining to us how we're to be born again as Yeshua taught us. By the text Paul is referring to, he again is teaching us that obedience to God's law is not an optional part of this choice for life. Now let's go back and look at an earlier part of Romans in Romans chapter 7. This is where Paul really shows us what, the, what he believes about the Torah. What is the truth about the Torah? Because Paul is the one that most people blame for saying it's nailed to the cross and we don't do it anymore. But we just saw how he actually did the vow of the Nazarite voluntarily, even though it wasn't necessary, to demonstrate how to love the Father. So Romans 7.1 says, Know you not, brethren? For I speak to them that know the law, know the Torah, how that the Torah has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the Torah to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she's loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she's free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she, she, she be married to another man. Verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Messiah. So what is that law that we're dead to? Well, we know it's the oral law, but it's also the written Torah just done in the flesh. You've got to do it by the Spirit for it to count. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Messiah that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead. So who is this that we're married to? It is the Word made flesh. It is the living Torah. That we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, see the violation of the law of sin, the law points that out, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. So the old way of doing it was the letter, which was just in the flesh, and the letter kills, we know. But the spirit gives life. So the Holy Spirit was to empower us to walk in his statutes, to keep his judgments, to do them according to Ezekiel 36. What shall we say then is the law sin? God forbid. No, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law said, You shall not covenant. Covet, but sin. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment. The commandment pointed out what the sin was. But this is talking about the sin itself. Wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. That means wickedness. For without the law, sin was dead. 
So in this Romans 7 passage, Paul's contrasting two different things. He's contrasting our old walk of being in the flesh and trying to obey God's law in the flesh to serving in newness of the Spirit. That's when you're born again. The oldness of the letter is trying to keep God's law without His Spirit. This was designed by God to be impossible. This was designed to show us that we needed a Savior. We need a Messiah. So in writing this passage, Paul was referring to the prophecy in Ezekiel about the reason for God giving us His Spirit. Ezekiel 36, starting at verse 26, says, A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will take out the stony heart out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments to do them. He doesn't give us new laws. He gives us the spirit to empower us to keep his original Torah. And that's actually what's written in our heart in the New Covenant. So we can see that the specific reason that God would put his spirit within us was to empower us to obey his law, his instructions. Now remember that Paul told us that obedience led to righteousness. That was Romans 6. Paul goes on to tell us that the commandments contained in God's law were ordained to life. Romans 7.10 And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be to death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me, killed me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just, and good. This is what Paul believes about the Torah, God's law. Now the oral Torah of the rabbis, that's a different thing, but this he's talking about God's law here. So Paul tells us clearly that God's law is holy. And his commandments are holy and just and good. Paul's telling us that it wasn't God's law that brought death, but it was the sin that God's law pointed out. That's what brought the death. Romans 7, 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, by the Torah, that sin might, uh, by the commandment, might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, fleshly, sold under sin. So now Paul reveals that the Torah is spiritual. What did Yeshua say? My words are spirit and they are life. He spoke the Torah to Moses. Moses was just the scribe. Yeshua is the one that gave it to Moses. So God's law is spiritual. Now we have to have God's spirit to be obedient. Without God's spirit, his law condemns us. Romans 7, 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Because it's in our flesh. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present within me. He wants to. But how to perform what which is good, I find not. Because you've got to have the Holy Spirit. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that that I would not, it's no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. So the second thing that Paul is contrasting in this passage is the law of God, in which he delights... To the law of sin which works in his members and in the next chapter he's going to call it the law of sin and death so Romans 7 21 I find then a law that when I would do good evil is present within me for I delight in the law of God after the inward man he's delighting in the Torah after the inward man his born-again spirit but I see another law in my members in the flesh warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Yeshua our Lord. It's by being born again, by getting the Holy Spirit like he said. So then with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And the next chapter is all about walking after the Spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. So when we're born again, we are empowered by God's Spirit to walk in obedience to His law, the law of our minds, which is renewed to this fact like Paul's mind was. Now we still have the law of sin and death warring in our fleshly body. It doesn't go away till we get our glorified bodies. Paul reveals in the next chapter that we have a choice to make. 
We have to choose to walk after the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Look at Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Messiah Yeshua. Now, how do we know we're in him? Because we keep his commandments. Remember, that was what we just read. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua has made me free from the law of sin and death. So we can walk above what our flesh wants us to do if we follow his spirit. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the Torah might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. So how does that work? Does it happen by osmosis? Or is it that the Holy Spirit's leading us to obey the Torah so that's how the righteousness is fulfilled in us? That's what it is. The Holy Spirit causes us to walk in his statutes, to keep his judgments, to do them. It's not an automatic thing. It's not that Jesus did it, so we don't have to. That's a lie. That's, that's called sin. If you don't keep the Torah, you're a sinner. And sinners are of the devil, according to 1 John chapter 3. So the righteousness of the law is fulfilled in us when we walk in obedience to God's law by His Spirit, as Paul told us in Romans 6, 16. So the law of the Spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua is God's Spirit in us, empowering us to walk in obedience to God's Torah freeing us from the law of sin and death, which is at work in our members, so that His righteousness might be fulfilled in us. And that's fulfilled as we walk in obedience. Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. What's the things of the flesh? Partying, getting drunk, going out and having sex with all the women, maybe playing too many video games that takes you away from the Word of God, maybe watching too much junk on TV. We've got to watch our time. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. What is that? The Torah, for one, he just told us it's spiritual. And then the gifts of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and all these other things, the gifts of, I mean, the working of miracles, the raising the dead, all these other things, these are things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Shalom. It's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Because the carnal mind, the fleshly mind, is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the Torah of God, neither indeed can be. So then they are in the flesh, that are in the flesh, cannot please God. So the things of the Spirit in context is the law of God, the Torah. Paul just told us that the Torah is spiritual in the last chapter. So we also see here that the carnal mind is not subject to God's law. It's clear here that this is not a good thing. If we're not subject to God's Torah, we have a carnal mind. Since the church has been lied to about this matter, most believers are carnally minded in this area because that's what they've been taught. They don't get into the book themselves and look at Yeshua's example. And as Paul said, this leads to death. We are to renew our mind with God's Torah if we want to be successful. This is just as true today as it was when God gave this fact to Joshua. And let's look at it. I quoted it a while ago, but let's look at it in the Scripture, Joshua 1.8. It says, This book of the Torah, the law, shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Now, remember in, it's either Corinthians or Galatians, Paul says that if you, you uh, keep one part of the law, you're a debtor to do all of it. It almost sounds bad the way that it's been taught, but right here it says if you do it all, you're going to be prosperous and have good success. Well, it's not a bad thing, but you got to know it all in order to commit to doing it all, so you got to study it. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. David gives us a second witness. He understood it as well in Psalms 1.1. 1, 1. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Who's that? The ones that tell us that the law is nailed to the cross and we don't have to do that anymore. Nor stands in the way of sinners. Who are sinners? People that violate the law. Nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh. And in his Torah he meditates day and night. And meditate means to speak, to mutter. So you're speaking it out of your mouth, just like he told Joshua. 
and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper, just like he told Joshua. Two witnesses here, and it's about his Torah. A lot of preachers will try to say, well, he's just talking about his word, and then they'll switch it to the New Testament. That's not what it says. It says Torah in the Hebrew, because it's the Torah where the power is. That's what Yeshua defeated the devil with. He could have quoted anything in the book, because he is the word. He chose three quotes from Deuteronomy. Showed us what the most powerful part of Scripture really is. You can defeat the devil with it. The top guy. So David goes on to tell us the biblical definition of God's truth. Look at Psalms 119, 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your Torah is the truth. This is what David says, the man after God's own heart. He goes on in verse 151. You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. Like Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, not one jot, not one tittle will pass away from the law till it's all fulfilled. And we're not there yet. Verse 1, 1989, Lamed. Forever, O Yahweh, your word is forever, forever settled in heaven. And it's talking about the Torah in this chapter. That's what this one, Psalms 119 is all about. His Torah is forever settled in heaven. So David tells us that God's law is the truth. Truth cannot change. God's law is forever settled in heaven. Because Yeshua, that's where he's at. He is the Torah. Now Moses made it clear that God's law is the foundation for our faith. That it can't be added to or taken away from. And we see this in Deuteronomy 4 too. You shall not add unto the words which I command you. Neither shall you diminish aught from it. That you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your God which I command you. And then we have a second witness in chapter 12 verse 32. What things soever I command you observe to do it. You shall not add thereto nor diminish from it. So this means that the Torah is our foundation. The prophets that wrote more books in the Bible, they couldn't add anything to it. They couldn't take anything away from it. It expounds on it, and it, it shows us details that we might not have seen otherwise. But it doesn't add to it, and it doesn't take away from it. Same thing with the teachings of Yeshua and of Paul and everybody else. That's how you interpret Scripture. You start at the beginning, and then everything else has to line up with the foundation in order to understand it. So the writings of the prophets and later the apostles do not add anything to God's Torah, nor do they take any away from his Torah. If they did, they would have to be rejected as heretical. That, that goes for the vision of Peter when this sheet's let down with all these animals. It says all manner of animals. It doesn't just say unclean animals. There were clean animals there too. But because of his religion, it taught that you couldn't go out and slaughter one yourself unless you were specially trained as a shochet. This is a ritual rabbi that knows how to slaughter properly. There's all kinds of rules that they made, just like Shabbat. You can't have a nick in your knife blade. I mean, there's, it's so detailed. And God is telling Peter, your religion's crap, basically. Just like Paul, count it dumb. Because what I've cleansed, don't call it common. He's talking about Gentiles, but he's also talking about the clean animals. Now, he's not telling Peter to eat pork, because the Torah says not to. That would be sin. God will never tell you to sin. That's how we can interpret a vision. If it's something that goes against the word, that can't be the meaning of it. So Peter, he was all perplexed and goes, what, what's the deal? I've never eaten anything uncommon or unclean. And then later on, he shows us that it's about the Gentiles. But it was also about not having to be a shochet to eat a kosher animal. You don't have to ritually slaughter it properly. That's not in the scripture. That was added by the Pharisees. It's part of that other stuff that we don't have to do. And this is also why we reject writings like the Book of Mormon and, and other goofy stuff because it doesn't line up with the word. So the writings of the prophets and the apostles, apostles amplify and expound on God's word. They tell us how to apply God's law to our new covenant walk, because we are in a new covenant. It's a better covenant, but nothing is passed away yet. Yeshua said, till heaven and earth passes away. Not one jot, not one tittle is going to pass from it. So it's all still applicable to us. They fill in more details is what they do. So if your interpretation of Paul's epistles or any other biblical writings conflict with obedience to God's Torah, your interpretation is wrong. Now let's look further at Paul's teaching on God's law. 2 Timothy 3.14 But continue you in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them, and that from a child you have known the Holy Scriptures. What scriptures did Timothy have as a child? Obviously it wasn't the New Testament because it wasn't even written yet. He's talking about what we would mislabel the Old Testament or the Tanakh. And he goes on and says, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus, Messiah Yeshua. 
It goes all the way back to the beginning in the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, you see the Aleph and the Tav. That's Yeshua. I am the Aleph and the Tav. He tells us that in Revelation. I'm the Alpha and Omega. Well, he's not speaking Greek to his Hebrew prophet. He's speaking Hebrew. He's saying, I'm the Aleph and the Tav. It's in the first sentence of the Bible. He's there. He's the seed of the woman that's going to crush the head of the serpent. I mean, he's there from the very beginning. It's all about Yeshua. So Paul tells Timothy that God's law, which is the Holy Scriptures that Timothy had from a youth, is able to make him wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Messiah Yeshua. So when Paul wrote this, like I said, there was no New Testament writings available. It wasn't codified until like the 4th century when it was finally determined what writings were going to be in our New Testament. It's hundreds of years later. So these would not be compiled for quite some time. Paul was encouraging Timothy to study and keep God's Torah, the law. This is the same pattern that we're all supposed to walk by that Paul was referring to in the previous passage that we looked at. So we would be wise to take Paul's advice ourselves. Now let's look at how the Bereans tested Paul's teaching. You're never supposed to just take any minister's word for anything. You're supposed to always take it back to the scripture and see what the scripture actually says. So look at how the Bereans did this. Paul wrote like two-thirds of our New Testament, his epistles. That's basically what it comprises of. So, I mean, he's an author of Scripture. But yet these Bereans didn't take that into account. They're going back to the established Scripture to prove it because everything Paul teaches has to line up with the Bible that they already have or it, it's not true. Acts 17.10, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming there went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So what scriptures were they searching? It's what's been mislabeled the Old Testament. That's the only Bible they had. It's the Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. So Bereans tested Paul's teachings against God's Torah. That means Paul was not contradicting the Torah. He wasn't contradicting the prophets or the writings. If his teachings had conflicted with God's law, Paul's teachings would have been rejected. Now, obviously, Paul was not teaching that the law was done away with. Paul always taught that we must obey God's law as we grow in our understanding of it. He taught that we must keep it in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter after the flesh. That's what the Jews were doing. They rejected the Messiah and were working out their own righteousness. Romans 9, 10, and 11 points this out. And you can't do it without the Messiah. You won't have righteousness. It's only through the Messiah that it's applied to us. Now this agrees perfectly with our Messiah's teaching on this subject. Matthew 5, 17. I just quoted it. We're going to read it. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. It's what they're pointing us towards. Remember Paul just said that? Don't forget the scriptures that you had from a youth, Timothy, because they make you wise unto salvation through Messiah Yeshua. They're pointing us to him. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. And you can look out the window. We still have an earth here, and there's still a heaven up there. It's not passed yet. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the Torah till all be fulfilled. Whoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments, like eating a pork chop or taking a mother and her eggs, the, the young and the mother all at the same time. These are things that we would count as trivial, but he says not one commandment. Whoever there shall, therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That's just breaking one and then teaching it's all right to do that. You're going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever shall do and teach them... The same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You want to be great in God's eyes? Keep his Torah and then teach others to do it. That's what Yeshua, the Messiah, the creator of the universe, just told us. So as we can see, heaven and earth are still here with us. And not all the prophecies have been fulfilled. The prophecies still foretell the return of the Messiah, the thousand-year reign, and the coming of a new heavens and a new earth. Yeshua tells us that if we want to be called great in the kingdom of heaven, we must do all of God's commandments and teach men so. This is the example that Yeshua gave us. This is what God wants us to do. Let's follow Yeshua's example. Let's walk, even as he walked. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your Torah, for your teaching, for your instructions. A loving Father giving his children instructions to keep them safe, to help them to grow, to help them to be like the Messiah. 
Thank you for caring for us so much, for sharing your heart with us, Father, giving us your word, revealing what you set up in your own throne room that we can appreciate and we can copy to give you the glory that you deserve. I thank you, Father, that you've made us a kingdom of priests. Thank you for the blessing on your people, Israel. Yivarechecha Yahweh Vayishmarecha Ya'er Yahweh P'navelecha V'hunecha Yesa Yahweh Pana Velecha Vayasim Lecha Shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. We are dismissed.